You know that feeling when you've made a great looking candle, but you can't smell a thing when it's lit, or it smells great, but it won't stay lit, or the candle burns great and it smells great, but it looks like <laughs> Been there, done that. I can empathize. I've been making candles for a long time and I have dealt with them all. Today, I'm gonna dive into seven of these common candle making problems, likely causes of those problems, and even some tips on how to fix them. Now, some of these you probably know, and some you might not. I really have no way of knowing, so I'm going to cover them all, assuming that you don't. Number one, sooting and or smoking from the wick. Now, this is a really common one, and let's start with the most obvious answer. First thing that everyone wants to jump to when we're talking about a wick that is throwing some smoke or some black soot is the wax. Any wax can soot, and if it's not wicked properly, any wax will soot. Now, different waxes have different looking soot. Some have a black soot, some have kind of a grayish color or even a whitish color. But the truth is that any candle wax, anything almost for that matter, can soot if it's not wicked properly. So the wax certainly does have an impact and the type of wax you're using can affect that. You will typically see less of this soot uh, with waxes like soy wax, but you might also struggle to wick those properly. Uh, coconut waxes, beeswaxes, soy waxes can be tougher to wick in general, so you might save on some of that soot, or at least a visible soot, but you might multiply the smoke and the struggle to wick it properly. So it's really a trade-off. So I don't want to spend as much time on wax, even though that does contribute to the smoke and soot. Let's talk about the more likely cause, and that is the improper wick. Now, when I say improper wick, that really means one of two things. It could be the size of the wick, which is the most common thing that people start with. When you get a lot of smoke and soot, you usually have a wick that is probably a little bit too large, but the wick type is also another contributing factor. A lot of different wicks work better with certain waxes than others. It's important to test various wicks with sample packs, for example, if you're experimenting with a new wax that you're not already comfortable with. And that is because, again, certain wicks work better with certain waxes. And it's important to figure that out. Then you can worry about the size. So if you're ever having a problem with wicking in general, and it doesn't matter what size of wick you're trying, then it's probably time to try a different wick type. Now, another possible cause is other materials inside of the wax, not just the wax itself, but the amount of fragrance oil you're using. If you're adding a high amount of fragrance oil, especially related to how much that wax can hold, you're making it a little bit tougher for that wick to perform properly. The wick is sort of like a straw and it's sucking fuel up and then delivering it to the flame and that's what keeps it going. If the more you add to that wax, the more you kind of clog that wick and make it difficult to perform well. So fragrance oil too much, uh, certain types of fragrance oil can clog it even more, but it's not just fragrance oil. Certain colors and dyes and other additives can do the same thing. So it's really about moderation and testing. You really wanna test everything you add to your wax to make sure it's not affecting the way the wick performs too much because that can cause sooting and smoke and other wick performance issues when it comes to your candles. Every time you make a change, you want to test that change and see if it affects the performance of the candle. Number two, ugly candle surfaces. Mostly the tops, but also on the sides as well if you're using a clear jar. And by this, I'm talking about the, uh, the cratered effect, the bumpy, the rough looking tops, or the crystallization that looks like um, you know, white flakes. Frosting is what most people refer to this as. Now, most of you probably already know this, but this is an issue specifically with soy wax. So it's really all about the type of wax with this. However, there are things you can do to kind of help minimize it. Now, knowing that it's a problem with soy wax, the obvious answer is to introduce some other things and blend it with your soy wax to try to minimize the amount of frosting. You can blend it with paraffin wax, you can blend it with coconut wax, you can blend it with beeswax. All of these will help reduce the amount of frosting, but the amount you need to add to really fully remove any frosting is just gonna vary because there's a lot of different kinds of soy wax, some frost more than others, and there's a lot of different kinds of coconut and paraffin waxes, and the amount you need of each one to reduce the amount of frosting you're getting is just gonna vary. So you just need to kind of introduce more and more until you get the results you want. Most people will start with like 10% of something and they just keep adding more and more of some other material to try to get rid of the frosting. Now I should, before I go any further, mention that this is purely cosmetic. This is not gonna impact the way the candle performs uh, and or the way it throws scent or anything like that. It's just the way it looks. So if you're not concerned about it and your customers aren't concerned about it or you just educate your customers about that it's normal for soy candles to look like that, then I really wouldn't worry about it too much. But if it is driving you nuts and it does bother you because I don't really like it either, then there are things you can do. Like I just mentioned, blending the soy wax with other materials, other waxes to reduce the effect of that frosting. And by introducing other materials, not only will it reduce the frosting, it can also help smooth out the tops as well. That is why wax blends have become so popular on the market for candle makers. Now, a couple other things though that contribute to these 
kind of ugly tops. One is the amount of fragrance oil you're using. A lot of times adding more fragrance oil will actually make that problem worse. So it could be as simple as reducing the amount of fragrance oil you're using. If you're someone that's using 10 or 12%, try backing it off a little bit. And of course you wanna keep your other characteristics in place. Like if you really like the hot throw you're getting, you might not wanna reduce it too much, but reducing the fragrance oil might actually help your frosting or ugly tops a little bit. Not to mention it might make the candle a little easier to wick as well. And then lastly is kind of how quickly these candles are cooling. And now this again will vary by wax and by environment. So you'll have to experiment a little bit with this, but how quickly or how slowly your candles cool can affect how quickly and how much they frost or have any other surface uh, issues. So if your current process is leading to these problems and they're not going away, then you might just change the process a little bit and see if you get any better results. Number three, wick mushrooms or carbon buildups. These are those little carbon balls on the top of your wick. Uh, and there's several things that, that can contribute to this. The first thing I would say to simplify it is everything that we talked about with the smoking and sooting applies here as well. So if you are uh, using the incorrect wick type, and there's not just one good wick type, there might be several that work with your wax, but wick type, wick size, too much fragrance oil, too much color, all of these additives, things that clog the wick and affect the performance of the wick will also lead to more mushrooming. And that is because it's incomplete combustion and the wick's having a hard time just burning optimally. So you might have to reduce the amount of fragrance oil or reduce the amount of color you're using or other additives. And you might need to change your wick type entirely. And then another obvious factor is just the burn time. So if you're getting a large carbon buildup on your wick within the first hour or two, that usually does indicate a problem. Now, not always, there can be other things that cause this to happen occasionally. Like no two candles in the world are ever exactly the same, even from the same batch. There's something slightly different. It could be the wick is slightly in a different part of the candle. It could be where the candle's burning. There's a lot of factors that can cause these things to happen. So if it happens occasionally, I wouldn't worry about it. But if you're consistently getting buildups of carbon heads on your wicks after just an hour or two, that indicates a problem. However, if you're getting a buildup and a mushroom on your wick seven hours in, you're doing a power burn, well, that's nothing to freak out about. That's actually quite normal. So it simply could mean that your wick just needs trimmed. So after three or four hours, trim your wick, relight it, and you're probably gonna be good to go. Again, what you want to prevent is a wick mushroom or carbon buildup happening so quickly. You don't want it to happen within the first couple hours or really even three to four hours excessively. Kind of judging for yourself, is this appropriate, is this reasonable, or is this just too much? Now, speaking of it just might needing to be trimmed, I wanna point out a couple new lighters uh, that I wanna tell you about. So I did an earlier video by a company called Redea. I'm, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure, but uh, you guys really liked those lighters. Those are those USB arc lighters that look like this that you turn on, they are rechargeable with the USB, and I don't know if the camera is going to pick it up or not. I might have to move my face. But those are just little arc lighters rather than using a traditional lighter to light your candles. And they came in several colors. If you, if you were around on the channel uh, when I did that video, they came in several colors, really cool. Um, they're USB rechargeable. I took uh, like 50 of them to a candle event and sold out within like two hours. So customers really dig them as well. The reason I wanna point them out again today is a couple things. One is there's a visible power indicator on the newer ones. Now they also have a flexible one that I believe comes in black or white and it's got the flexible head, which makes it easier in some of those jars that are odd shaped or large or hard to get to. Uh, but it, otherwise it works the same. It's USB rechargeable. It's got a battery indicator light. Uh, so really, really cool as well. But one other thing from the same company, some of you are always asking about where you can get uh, wick trimmers and little candle accessories like that to sell at craft fairs or maybe throw in as like little packs or kits when you're selling your candles. They have these candle accessory pack. Now this little three piece kit comes with a cool little rose gold candle snuffer. It comes with a wick dipper, again, rose gold. And of course comes with the rose gold wick trimmer. So if you guys are looking for a, a good place to look for a little cheap accessories uh, that you can sell as an add-on or throw some kind of bonus or giveaway or something like that, then uh, check these out as well. Now, once again, the company is hooking you all up, all the viewers here on this channel with some special pricing. So if any of this does interest you, these little lighters, the adjustable lighter, the uh, candle accessory pack. And again, there's different colors and options. You can check it all out on the website um, and I will have those links in the description, but there are custom unique links just for you guys to save you guys some money as well. And we're talking about very affordable prices, like $7 for some of this stuff. So check it out if you guys want, it's in the description below. I've been using them myself for my own candle testing and I use them around the house. I got them stashed all over the place. It's cool because you never run out of fluid and you don't ever have to keep buying all those lighters all the time. You just recharge them USB. It's, it's really nice. And like I said, they were a big hit with customers at a couple live shows that I did. So uh, I mean, I ran out, I, I, I didn't get enough. So 
uh, that's a good sign. I mean, it's not a good sign I didn't get enough, but it's a good sign that I ran out. You know what I'm saying. And if you're not on my Instagram or other channels, be sure to join because I give away things like this periodically as well. So, all right, enough about lighters and accessories. Let's get back to these candle making problems. And that is number four, non-vibrant colored candles. So for those of you that color your candles and use candle dye, uh, like me, the majority of my candles are dyed. I sell both, but my dyed ones always sell better. So I like to use colored dye and I just personally like them. But I like them a lot more when I get the color that I'm after. And I get this question quite a bit. How do I get my candle colors to look the way they do? I don't know how well they're gonna show in the background behind me because it's kind of dark, but you guys have seen them before. And a lot of people reach out, how do I get those colors? Because when they try to get them, they get kind of diluted, uh, more like pastel colors. They're just not real rich. The first thing we have to talk about is, is the type of wax you're using. And that is because that really significantly affects the way the color comes out. So remember, you're getting color in like a liquid or a block form, and that's the true color. Like that's just nothing but color. But when you add color to something, it becomes diluted to a degree, right? Now, some waxes will tend to keep a lot of that richness, some of those vibrant hues and vibrant colors. So mostly your palm waxes and paraffin waxes, some of your coconut waxes, those will keep those nice, rich colors. And then you've got waxes like beeswax and soy wax that uh, will make much more lighter pastel colors. You can still get pretty rich colors. It's gonna depend on the amount of color you're using, the specific color you're using, the specific soy wax you're using. Uh, so it will vary, but in general, paraffin, palm, and coconut will have richer colors than soy and beeswax, for example. And there are other waxes as well. So yeah, that's the first thing. It comes down to the type of wax you're using, but it also comes down to the kind of dye you're using. Most dyes will come in blocks and chips or liquid dye. They're all really concentrated, but depending on where you get your dye, the quality of that dye, how much dye you're using, and specific colors are easier to get good rich colors than others. So I'm experimenting and some testing to see what you can come up with. Sometimes it takes mixing a couple of colors to get the color you're after. For example, using red dye alone usually doesn't give you a very good red. It kind of makes more of a pink. But if you mix some red with some orange or some brown, you can typically get more of that red color you're looking with. That's just an example. I like to use magenta and orange to get a good red, but it will vary by the supplier that you're getting your dyes. Some color you might need to use a little bit more dye than another dye. But be cautious and monitor the amount of dye you're using because the amount that you're using can start to contribute to wick issues. As we talked about earlier, you don't want to clog the wick. A general rule or kind of guide you'll see out there is to try to stay under like 10 drops of color per pound of wax if you're using liquid dye. I, that's not really a hard fast rule because some waxes are more forgiving than others. Some wicks can handle more additives than others. It just really depends. So there's no hard fast rule but I would try to stay somewhere around that range. The key is to make sure that uh, if you're gonna add more dye, make sure you test it afterwards to make sure the candle still burns the way you want it to. If it doesn't, you might need to adjust the amount of dye you use. But the simple answer to the question is, is I experiment a lot with colors and it's gonna come down a lot to the type of wax you're using and the dyes you're using. If you're interested in learning more about colors and dyes and working with all that, I do have other videos on the channel that talk specifically about that. Number five, this is a big one. Poor hot throw. So how strong your candle smells when it's burning? Well, I feel like a broken record here, but the first thing we have to talk about is the type of wax. Now, I have addressed this many times on the channel, but most of you probably know, typically speaking, and I say that because there are always exceptions, but typically speaking, you're gonna get the strongest hot throw from waxes like paraffin, and then you can start working some other ones in there like your palm and your coconut waxes, but then your soy waxes and beeswaxes are typically on the lower end of the scale when it comes to fragrance throw. And it's just the way those waxes are. On a molecular level, there's not much you can really do to change how a wax works. Doesn't mean you can't get good hot throw from all of those waxes that I talked about. It just means kind of naturally speaking, on its own, natively, without trying to do too much, certain waxes throw scent better than others. But it also comes down to fragrance oil, both quality and type. Some fragrance oils are a higher quality, more concentrated than others. Some uh, come down to the type of fragrance oil. For example, some of your florals can be really strong. Some of them can be kind of light. Some of your bakery scents will knock your socks off. Uh, they're just so strong. It just depends. So some fragrance oils are meant to be a little bit lighter. They're just designed that way. And of course, the amount of fragrance oil you're using. Some waxes will perform very, very good at 6%. 
whereas others need like 10 or 12%. So that kind of goes back to the type of wax you're using. But sometimes you need to use a little bit more fragrance oil, but sometimes that also just doesn't work. But you may need to adjust the amount of fragrance oil you're using to get the results that you're after. And you know, some of this is common sense. Some of this is obvious. Proper wicking is another big one. Obviously you want your candle burning correctly to burn optimally and give the best fragrance throw. So if you're if you're using a wick that's undersized and you're getting a very small melt pool, then you're not gonna really get a whole lot of scent throw. The scent is coming from that liquid melt pool that's kind of dissipating that fragrance into the air. And if you're not getting a very big melt pool, then you're not getting very good hot throw. Uh, on the flip side, you might have a wick that's way too big. It's oversized. You've got a great melt pool, but it's burning so hot, it's almost burning off the fragrance as it's burning. And that's not really helping you out either. It's just all about balance. A proper burning wick for a good burning candle. But now when I'm talking about milk pool, that also means the size of the jar plays a part in this as well. I think it's safe to say that a small candle is gonna have less scent throw. It's not as strong as a larger candle, assuming everything else is equal. And that's because the melt pool is bigger in a larger jar. So stepping up the size of your jar should typically increase the amount of your fragrance throw as well, which similarly, the size of the room you're burning the candle in is going to contribute that. If you burn a big candle in a small room, it's going to be overpowering. If you're burning a small candle in a big room, then you might not smell it at all. So all of these factors contribute to how well you smell the candle. And I guess the moral of this story is some of the things you can control when you're making the candle and some things you can't. Some of it's about the, how the candle's made and some of it's about where the candle's being burned. So just worry about the things you can control and uh, the rest is kind of more in your customer's hands. If you're interested in a lot more details about uh, candle fragrance and scent throw in general, then I have a video that I posted not too long ago called Scent is King. I will have that linked uh, as well so you can check that out if you haven't seen it already but there are several other videos on this channel that I've talked about scent throw and proper wicking uh, and testing. There's just, there's just tons. So if you're not already a subscriber, be sure to subscribe, go to the videos section on this channel and just browse them all. There's a lot talking about all these different topics in more detail. Number six, wet spots or jar adhesion. If you're brand new to candle making, wet spots is just a term that we all use that's related to how the candle looks against the side of the jar. Uh, it looks like a wet spot. What it's really is just inconsistent jar adhesion of the wax. So in certain parts of the jar, the wax is really close up against and it looks perfect. In other areas of the jar, it's pulled away a little bit and it looks just kind of odd. Uh, again, first thing that's worth mentioning here is that this does not affect the performance of the candle whatsoever. It's just cosmetic. And to be honest, most customers don't really care about it as well. But if it drives you crazy and it does drive a lot of candle makers crazy, there are a few things that uh, cause this and things that you can do. The first thing, ding, 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 you probably guessed it, it's the wax type. I swear wax type affects pretty much everything about candle making. Uh, and the reason I say wax type here is jar adhesion issues, how well the wax sticks to the jar walls, is all about contraction and expanding. Wax expands as it's heated up and then contracts as it cools, just like most things on earth. And that means when you pour in your liquid wax, it's filling the jar wall to wall and everything looks perfect. As it cools, it contracts a little bit and parts of it pull away from the jar. But some waxes don't contract as much. Softer waxes tend to stick better to the side of the walls and harder waxes, waxes that firm up as they shrink, will contract and that is why they will pull away from the side of the jar. So if this is such an important issue for you that you just can't get past it, then I would experiment with softer waxes, waxes that are known to have pretty good jar adhesion. The jar size and shape and dimensions also play a part in this. If you've got an odd shaped jar, you're gonna have really weird inconsistent cooling of the wax, which also means weird inconsistent shrinkage of the wax. So you might have it's harder to get uniform jar adhesion when you've got odd shaped jars. Tall jars have more room for the wax to shrink down as it cools, which means you might get more of a kind of a dip around the wick on the top. Whereas wider jars have more room for the wax to shrink inward. So you might have more jar adhesion issues on the side. It really just depends on the jar and the wax you're using are the two number one causes of jar adhesion issues. However, uh, additives like Vibar or steric acid also cause your wax to harden up a little bit. And there are pros and cons to that. But one of the cons is that it can cause your wax to shrink and pull away from the jar a little bit. So that's another potential cause. The cooling rate, again, is another potential cause. If your wax is poured very hot, that means when it cools is a much larger change in temperature. That means more change in the amount the candle shrinks. So you can experiment with preheating your jars or pouring your wax at a cooler temperature so that it doesn't shrink as much when it cools. These are all things you can try if jar adhesion or wet spots are driving you nuts. Now one kind of like little bonus pro tip here, a lot of candle makers are always talking about making sure your jars are far enough apart from each other. 
So like four inches apart, because you want consistent cooling around the candle. But this is sort of misleading a little bit, so I wanted to clarify that. Uh, jar adhesion, consistent cooling for your candle, isn't just about being far enough apart from the next candle. It's really about consistency all the way around. So if you're only pouring two candles, well then yeah, you want them pretty far apart. You don't want them right next to each other because those two close sides will stay hot a lot longer than the two opposing sides. Same with three candles and so on, or even four candles. But if you're pouring a lot of candles, six, eight, 10, 12, and you're pouring a whole table full of candles, then you don't need them all four inches apart. Uh, really what you want is consistent cooling all the way around, which means if all of your candles in the middle are surrounded by other candles, then they're all cooling at the same rate. So what's really important is that making sure all of your candles are cooling consistently all the way around, not necessarily that there are a certain amount of inches apart from one another. Hopefully that makes sense. But if you look at some other large brands, they're not separating all their candles by four or six inches apart. They're pouring entire assembly lines full of candles and they're all sandwiched in there nice and neat together. That's pretty standard. So again, you want consistency all the way around, but not necessarily just a certain amount of distance apart. Number seven, last but not least, is drowning wicks. So I get this question all the time. They light the candle, it starts off fine, but then later on in that burn, or maybe several burns later, the candle just kind of dies out. The wick just kind of drowns out, or at least gets really small and looks like it's gonna drown out. Uh, the first thing here is some of the waxes are much more viscous than others, and they are a little tougher to burn. They could be more dense or whatever the case may be, certain waxes are easier to burn than others. Most paraffin waxes burn a lot easier than most soy waxes. So you typically need a hotter or more powerful wick for some of those harder to burn waxes. The key, like I've said many times before in this video and on this channel, is to test to try to find the best wick type for your wax. And then obviously also to find the best wick size. So start with the type, then work on the size and make sure you test the entire wick top to bottom, the entirety of the candle. A lot of people like to only test a portion of the candle. I don't advise that because you're not getting the entire picture. A lot of candles burn perfectly fine towards the top uh, because there's more oxygen up there and that at the bottom, they struggle a little bit more. And so the way it burns changes from top to bottom. So a lot of people instead will only fill up a candle halfway and test for the bottom only. Well, that's fine because you know that that's gonna burn well, but then the top might be overwicked or underwicked. You don't know. You don't know unless you test the entire candle. So many makers in these shortened abbreviated tests feel confident based off the, the test they did, but they didn't test the entire candle. So later when they get a complaint that the wick is drowning out, they don't know why or they don't have as much information. So test your candle completely. It's fine if you wanna start off with a half poured candle just to get kind of close and get a right idea, but I would always, always, always recommend testing a candle entirely, start to finish, top to bottom, to make sure you got the right wick. Now the size of the candle and the number of wicks you're using can also contribute to this. Multiple wicked candles, so two wick and three wick candles, you've got more wicks competing for fuel and for oxygen. And again, they might start off great, but then later they might start to struggle. That's pretty common with two and three wick candles. They start off looking fantastic. And then like the second or third burn, they all start getting kind of weak. And that is because they're fighting for the same oxygen and they're fighting for the same fuel. And you just kind of got to keep testing and go through the process until you find a ratio and a balance that works for all of them. You might have to change your wick type. You might have to adjust and, and mess with different sizes, but eventually you can fight, figure it out and you find a good happy medium where all the wicks just play together in perfect harmony. And then lastly, it's too much fragrance oil or other additives for that matter can clog the wicks. And that clogging of the wick that we talked about earlier can cause either one of two things to happen, either mushroom and big carbon buildups that we talked about, smoking and sudden and all of that, or the wick can just completely clog up and just not perform and it just kind of drowns out. It fizzles out and dies because it can't get the fuel that it needs. In some cases, the wick is getting too much fuel. In some cases, it can't get enough. A drowning wick is an indication that the wick is not getting enough fuel. So either adjust the amount of fragrance oil, back off some of the other additives or color you're using, or it could be one of these other things that you just need to work through the testing process until you find the right wick. These seven issues are kind of a guide and there are a lot of causes and things that can contribute to them. And hopefully kind of identifying some of these causes and using some of these tips can help you troubleshoot a little bit. But really all of these problems can be identified and solved by just continuing to test, make changes and test. I feel like we talk about that till we're blue in the face on this channel, but I 
truly believe that testing is the most important thing when it comes to candle making. You're gonna end up with the best performing candles if you're diligent about testing. In future videos, we will dive into some other common candle making problems. And in past videos, like I mentioned earlier, we have talked about several of them already. But I hope this guide helps out many of you, especially some of you new candle makers to the craft. And right next to the subscribe button is a little bell icon. Be sure to click that as well and to turn on notifications. That way when I post new videos, you will be notified. Otherwise, you just, you just might miss them. Don't forget to check out some of these lighters and accessories down in the description below. If you're interested, please give this video a thumbs up by hitting the like button below. I would really appreciate it and I'll see you all next time. Thanks.